Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. We have a very exciting program planned called I Don't Want to Talk About It and a terrific speaker to who wants to talk about it, uh, Robert Kestenbaum, who is currently the Monument Specialist with Dignity Monuments, and he's formerly the Director of Family Services at Woodlawn Cemetery. So he's had the I Don't Want to Talk About It conversation with many families and he's ready to help you start that conversation with yours. So without further introduction, I am so pleased to introduce Robert Kessenbaum, our speaker this morning. Thank you, Sarah, and good morning, everybody. Um, I hope everybody likes snow because we're about to get some. Uh, I had nothing to do with it. Um, as, uh, as Sarah mentioned, um, I am uh, current with, currently with uh, Dignity Memorials. Um, I've uh, been asked to launch a new program for them. Prior to that, I was Director of Family Services at the Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx. And prior to that, uh, I was for many years with a very large uh, organization and uh, burial society. So um, I have a, a long and varied background uh, in the field. Um, the good news is you can ask me about anything and I will absolutely be totally certain at the points where I don't know the answer. However, I also will be able to get that answer for you. Um, mm. Basically, I am a, um, an end of life planning advocate. Now, sometimes planning is done far in advance Sometimes planning is done at the time of need, but regardless of what the lead time is, the amount of time uh, before a decision is made, uh, it's still planning, short-term planning, long-term planning. Anytime a decision is being made, it involves a, uh, a plan. Um, so the key to keep in mind is that there are decisions to be made and in deciding how to go about that, it's best to decide another decision um, when the decision should be made and how you feel comfortable making uh, those decisions. My approach in, uh, in my dealings with people is to basically help them navigate through, de through the decisions. I make no decisions for people. Instead, what I do is really three areas. I work on empowerment, making sure everybody knows they're in charge. Education, making sure they have the information they need. And uh, communication, how that folds in to the, uh, to the planning and decision-making process. So basically I'm providing the information that people need in order to be able to make the best decision for themselves and their, uh, and their loved ones. And the position really is that nobody should be compelled to make these kinds of decisions at what is a, um, an emotional and stressful time. Um, in general, my approach is also that there's, there are no wrong answers. Um, people will sometimes say to me, I don't know what I want. And I always answer the same way. And that is by saying, I'll bet you know what you don't want. And they sort of look at me like I'm crazy, which is a look that I've gotten many times. Uh, and uh, the reason I do it is, is that empowerment that I mentioned before. Because at some point in the process, when we're going over options, they're going to stop me and say, oh, no, 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 I, that, um, I have no interest in that. And then when that happens, I remind them of what I said before, namely, I'll bet you know what you don't want. And, um, and that's, that's the empowerment part, to make sure everyone knows that they are in charge. Nobody is going to make these decisions for them if they are uh, involved. Nobody's going to take that away from them. Now, 
One thing to remember, however, in many instances, decisions are made for us. And by that, I mean uh, things relating possibly to legal constraints. Um, an example of that uh, that I encounter very often is people who have opted for cremation and they want to scatter their remains in a certain place. Well, there are laws that limit what one can do in that regard. Uh, there are also cultural or religious norms uh, that, uh, that people will follow where, uh, in effect, decisions are being made for them. Their options are, uh, are narrowed. Uh, and uh, there might be rules and regulations involved uh, in a cemetery, for example. All cemeteries, which we'll talk about later, have rules and regulations about various kinds of things in terms of what can be buried, who can be buried, what kind of memorialization is permitted, things of that nature. Um, the best you can do in that instance is to really understand when a limitation is presented to you, understand that limitation fully, understand if there's any wiggle room at all, and understand uh, basically uh, ultimately what the menu of options uh, are. Uh, and by the way, we'll every so often um, we'll uh, we'll stop for a moment, and uh, you'll have an opportunity to uh, ask any questions uh, on anything we've uh, we've talked about uh, up until that point. Um, in terms of the importance of planning or the importance of pre-planning. Um, it is really three areas that uh, we're looking at that inform why pre-planning is important. Number one that I hear from most people is that they're looking to shield their loved ones from having to make a decision at the time of need. At what is presumably going to be an emotional and stressful time. I can tell you that I have never, and never is a big word for me, because there are always exceptions, but in this case, there are none. I have never had a complaint from a family member of someone who pre-planned that they were in some way felt uh, cheated out of the opportunity to make these plans, to make these decisions at the last moment. In fact, just the opposite. They're thankful that mom or dad or whoever it was uh, took the time and uh, took this action to make this plan for, uh, for this eventuality. Secondly, there are financial reasons to pre-plan. Over time, costs increase and they can increase significantly and they don't necessarily increase in a straight line. Uh, many costs will, uh, increase greatly one year, not at all another year. There's really no way to predict other than the general point that costs will go up over time. There's also uh, the issue of stress purchasing. There have been some studies that indicate that people who, uh, who are in a situation where pre-planning was not done uh, might tend to purchase things that aren't necessarily needed uh, or aren't required. Uh, options uh, are put before you, and uh, you might select some things that um, you don't really need. And more importantly, under other circumstances in a different frame of mind, you wouldn't find important. So stress purchasing makes that, uh, that financial commitment even larger. And then the last reason to uh, to pre-plan is that it gives an opportunity for somebody to clearly express their wishes, exactly what they want. And there are all kinds of uh, resources available. Uh, many funeral homes have on their website uh, a, uh, a planning guide option, which gives them the uh, opportunity to see exactly the areas where they're going to be needing to make, uh, uh, to make decisions. So um, those are the three areas, shielding loved ones, uh, the financial uh, area, and, uh, and the opportunity to express 
one's wishes uh, very clearly. Um, our discussion uh, this morning will cover four general areas. Um, the services of the funeral home, which is really a brief encounter in the overall scheme of things. Um, the uh, services that are provided by a cemetery, if there's a cemetery involved, which is certainly a longer term relationship. Uh, the issue of memor uh, memorialization, which is um, forever, I would uh, assert. Uh, and then uh, some legal uh, matters. Uh, let's take the last one first. It is recommended highly that a consultation with an attorney who specializes in trusts and estates and or elder law, depending upon your specific needs, is uh, advisable. Um, your neighbor may know some things, but they, unless they're an attorney, uh, they're not the expert that you need. Even if they just went through the process themselves, by the way, because you are not looking for cookie cutter, you are looking for something that is specific to your needs. And it's very important that you get exactly what you need based on um, your uh, wishes and desires. The attorney will advise you in various areas such as uh, a will, um, and some of these are obvious, of course, um, uh, a living will, a personal health directive, the, the do not resuscitate or DNR uh, order, which, uh, which uh, people should, uh, should decide about, um, healthcare proxy, the appointing of an agent, which is something fairly new, but uh, we'll touch on that a little bit later. Uh, and things like power of attorney. Um, power of attorney is an interesting one to me because many, many times uh, in the cemetery setting, I encountered people who came to the office with the power of attorney document in their hand saying, I control the affairs of this particular individual who passed away yesterday, and I'm here to uh, take care of things. And we have to inform them that the, the uh, authority that is granted in the power of attorney uh, basically dies when the person who granted that authority passes. So uh, power of attorney uh, does not survive that, uh, that event. And uh, certainly um, the, uh, the attorney on the line would, would be able to talk uh, more about that. Um, Especially in New York State, the end of life industry is very, very highly regulated. There are um, lots of consumer protection laws in place. And again, New York State is, uh, is quite stringent. Um, it's interesting if you look in other states, uh, uh, it can be very loose. Uh, things like, for example, in New York State, there's something called non-combination laws. So you will not see a funeral home and a cemetery that are together in any way, physically or corporately, ownership-wise. In some states, that's just fine. But in New York State, those are separate by law. Uh, again, in other states, uh, you might find a funeral home with a cemetery, with a florist, with a caterer, with a monument uh, uh, office, everything together. Uh, and one could argue that that's more convenient, but again, in New York State, those are separate by law and the reason is consumer protection. Now, what that means is in New York State, you must have a funeral director to take care of the disposition, regardless of the type of service somebody decides upon. Nothing happens without the funeral director. Director being the key term, just like the director of a play or a movie, that person has full control over implementing your decisions. So areas, for example, relating to transportation, and by transportation, I mean something called removal, which is taking the uh, person who has passed from wherever they passed, bringing them 
to the uh, funeral home until uh, final disposition, whatever that means in that particular instance, uh, is, uh, is done. Um, the administrative paperwork, things like permits, death certificates, things of that nature, is something that the funeral director would, uh, would do. Assorted services, preparation of the deceased, uh, visitation, uh, memorial services, things of that nature, and scheduling. Uh, it would be scheduling of anything, uh, including all the way up to uh, disposition. And in this case, disposition would be really one of two things, um, primarily. One is um, the final resting place, the actual placement of the deceased, or transportation scheduling, rather, and then transportation uh, if cremation is, uh, is uh, what the person has uh, opted for. Uh, and it's only a licensed funeral director who can make the arrangements with the uh, cremation facility or crematory, as it's called in the industry, uh, for that service to take place. I would caution you that costs vary greatly from funeral home to funeral home. And they must, funeral homes must provide what's called a general price list. It is available at no obligation. And in fact, it's supposed to be available for somebody if they just walked in, that it's on display so that one could take it without having to ask for it. And this allows people to compare from funeral home to funeral home if they're into that kind of thing. Uh, and this dates back to a time when there were some abuses. Uh, fortunately, I can say that that's uh, long, pretty much long past, uh, but there were abuses in the funeral industry. And um, like many laws, this one has to do with solving a problem uh, or addressing a problem that existed. Um, it's also important to know that when dealing with the funeral home, the law is very explicit in terms of many things that the funeral director or the funeral home cannot do, or I should say may not do. It is illegal, for example, for the funeral home personnel to criticize any choice that one would make. Uh, you will not hear a funeral director say to somebody, wait a minute, that's the casket you chose? I thought you told me you loved so-and-so. That's, you really need this one over here that happens to be $2,000 more. That is not uh, permitted by law, as is pressuring the, uh, the purchaser to, uh, to buy some service or, uh, or item. Um, pressure sales, which is subjective, of course, but pre pressure selling is uh, explicitly illegal. Funeral home can also not charge a fee for handling what's called cash advances. Many times a funeral home will charge the family, the individual, for a service that somebody else is doing. For example, uh, for the cremation, the funeral home will charge the, uh, the purchaser, the person making the arrangements, the cost of the cremation and whether somebody pays the crematory directly or the funeral home the amount is the same the funeral home is not permitted to charge a fee over and above it's a complete uh, pass along and it's illegal to charge for anything that is not explicitly listed on the contract and therefore not agreed to you must get everything in writing. It is, um, it's a formal contract and one's, um, uh, one's rights and privileges are, uh, are spelled out there. And this is an important document. So if you have one, if it's a pre-plan, for example, put it with your uh, important papers that are uh, easily accessible. Now, 
the most important, most significant difference between a, the services of a funeral home and the services of a cemetery is that a funeral home can do what it's done this morning, again this afternoon, tomorrow, next week, next month, over and over again. It's completely replicable. Whereas a cemetery, every space is unique in some way. It might be right next door to another space, but it is a physical item that once it is purchased and owned by somebody, it is no longer available. So those are, uh, are the two uh, main differences. It is also, um, uh, the, the other main difference is that a funeral home is a business in terms of a for-profit venture. Not that there's anything wrong with that. A cemetery is a, in New York State, is a not-for-profit venture. And therefore, they're regulated by uh, different laws and, uh, and different codes within the laws and different agencies of, uh, of New York State. Um, the, so it's important to know that those things are separate and what they do. Now, just staying with the, uh, with the funeral home for a moment, we have lots of questions about pre-planning a funeral. And uh, all funeral homes can provide that service. Couple things. Uh, there's a difference between pre-planning and prepaying. There are funeral homes that will allow you to pre-plan without prepaying. That service basically gives the opportunity for the individual to express their wishes with the understanding that the estate will pay the uh, expenses later on when the services are provided. And by the way, they will pay at the costs that are in effect at that time in the future. The way to lock in today's costs is with the pre-need agreement where prepaying is involved. And it would cover all details. Mm in terms of um, um, the things that are available now and the things that will be available in the future and all of uh, uh, the bridge from now to the future in terms of anything that might happen uh, in between. Now, these agreements can be guaranteed or they can be non-guaranteed. It's important if you wanna lock in today's costs that it says that it is a guaranteed pre-plan. And the law requires that there be three aspects of that, uh, that pre-plan, that you get a general price list, which is something I referenced before, a what's called a pre-need itemized statement, which is a clear list of the items that are included in what has been, uh, what has been paid for, and the pre-need agreement itself. That's the actual contract that the funeral home is promising to provide the following items at the agreed upon price that is in the paperwork. Um, Robert, I'm gonna jump in right there because we have a question right on topic sure. that you were just talking about. So our participant <laughs> asks, do you suggest people shop around before choosing which funeral home to prepay with? So that, that is an interesting question. And really, uh, not, to, um, not to be evasive, but it depends. And it depends on, on several things. It's easy for me to sit here and say, yes, as a good consumer, you should shop around. Frankly, a lot of people don't want to. They think that shopping around for a funeral director or a funeral home is, uh, it's just, it's not within their uh, DNA, as it were. If somebody doesn't mind doing it, and if cost is a major uh, consideration, uh, then it could help to do so. However, there is the opportunity to get a sort of global picture 
about the varying costs um, between funeral homes. There are some people who know just because that's where their family has always gone or their uh, church or congregation has always gone, they know which funeral home they're going to be uh, going to. But for those people who are really just starting out completely, the general price list that I referenced before can be a wonderful tool because it'll give a global understanding about the relative costs of the items that can be comparable. Now, unfortunately, the general price list is not item for item exact, but if you take a look at uh, side by side, two general price lists, you will be able to tell which funeral home is by and large more costly. The best example that I can give you, and it's a, uh, it's, it's um, very stark in, its, uh, in the information is, if somebody wanted something called direct cremation, which is the simplest cremation service one can, uh, one can have, the services of the funeral home, there are uh, funeral directors or funeral homes where that service can be uh, arranged for well under $1,000, not including the cremation itself, but the service of the funeral home, under $1,000. There is a funeral home in Manhattan that for exactly the same service, it's $10,000. What's the difference? No difference. The only difference is the cost. So certainly you would want to know if the funeral home with whom you're speaking has, um, is on the higher end, the middle end, the lower end, um, now, that's a good example because there's such a big difference, but perhaps it's a bad example because there are funeral homes that specialize in direct cremation and are priced uh, accordingly. Um, so I hope, that, uh, I hope that answers that, uh, that question. On the pre plan yes, Sarah? Okay, so the first question is, what happens if I prepaid and later move to another state? Okay. So the, um, the, the account, first of all, the, the pre-planning uh, funding goes into an account, which is in the name of the individual, not in the name of the funeral home. Um, the, as a matter of fact, the law says that the funds have to be deposited in that account and it's only certain types of accounts that are allowed, that they be deposited within 10 days and that the individual has to be notified by the funeral home within 30 days. The uh, annually, the person who has made the pre-plan will get an IRS form showing the interest that has accrued on that account and that is taxable income. Now, all that leads up to the answer to the question, which is that account is portable. It is yours. You can change it anytime as long as the pre-plan is something called revocable. There are also irrevocable accounts. The irrevocable accounts are um, for most of the time when there's an application uh, for uh, Medicaid and uh, there's a spend down going on, which Sarah could certainly uh, Also speak for to. SSI benefits. Yes, yes. So those two are the, uh, are the areas where the account would be irrevocable and irrevocable is exactly what it sounds like. So much so that if the account is more than sufficient to uh, address the, um, uh, what has been arranged, any balance uh, does not go back to the purchaser, does not go back to the, uh, to the funeral home, it goes into the, uh, into the system, as it were, the, uh, the government. Um, so um, now in general, by doing a pre-plan, the person's wishes are protected. I say in general, because again, Sarah could give us examples of where this doesn't necessarily follow, but the law says that the person making the arrangements 
is supposed to, in quotes, faithfully carry out the directions of the decedent. But again, Sarah could tell you that uh, the field of law is one of exceptions and nuance and, uh, and uh, sort of the buffet menu of life. That's um, absolutely true, but most clients that we've worked with will follow someone's wishes with a pre-plan because yes. the family is just so happy that when they're faced with a very difficult and sad situation that it's been done for them. They don't have to make decisions. They have a dedicated person to speak with and that everything just, it, it happens very seamlessly. And that's really a big relief for many families. So in the 10 years I've been with Keenan Bean, I've only had one situation where there was a disagreement with the family and the decedent's wishes ended up being followed. The client wanted to um, be interred in mausoleum space and that was very expensive. And the kids didn't want to use the mausoleum space, but because our client prepaid for the funeral and for the mausoleum space, even though that wasn't really what the, the kids wanted, they ultimately ended up going with it because the decision had been made, the funds had been paid. And at that point, um, they, they didn't want to, to pay for another funeral. So if you have very strong wishes and beliefs, it really is the way of, of locking in to make sure that those final choices of yours are truly followed. And right. we have a couple more questions that came in right on this topic. Yeah, so just to if I if I may, Sarah, just just briefly uh, on that, and I'm not sure. It depends on the family and what we can do about this. And by by we, I mean the person who's making the pre-plan. And when we talk about communications within the family, this will this will come out. But where we see this issue is not so much when the the kids. Uh, don't want um, or want something other than what was uh, expressed, but rather when there is disagreement uh, amongst the kids. And uh, that's when you can have some uh, really interesting dynamics where, you know, take something as simple as um, uh, the, the arrangements being done at the funeral home and uh, the, uh, the son who lived in the same town as mom um, uh, it says that, uh, well, mom should have her glasses on in the, in the casket because she was an avid reader. And that was what she looked like most often. And the son who lives cross country says, no, I don't think that's right. And the first son says, how would you know? You never visited, you never called. And uh, the next uh, thing is uh, dicey. So that too is why it's very important to, uh, to have these things in place. Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I, I agree. And luckily from the attorney side, those sorts of disagreements in the moment aren't usually a call to me, so. Right. But we do have uh, two more questions that came in on topic. One of them was just, adding on to the pre-plan discussion where our participant is thinking of pre-planning locally in Westchester County and may move to Florida in the future and then may end up having um, their funeral be in Florida. How do they move their contract from Westchester to their new choice of funeral home in Florida should they make that move? Okay. So uh, again, it depends. There are two possibilities. Uh, in some instances, basically, you're just going to cancel the pre-plan at the funeral home in, uh, in New York, take the funds, and start a new one in Florida. The exception to that is there is um, one in particular um, sort of national network of funeral homes mm -hmm. where the pre-plan is portable. And um, that is just coincidentally, sorry, I don't mean to be this a commercial, to be this uh, sound like a commercial, but the dignity network of funeral homes, which is all over the country, 
some uh, someone is able to uh, to do that. Um, but uh, there's also the issue of the final resting place. If uh, if a decision to move to Florida includes a decision that the final resting place will be in Florida, then pretty much everything should be moved there. If on the other hand, the person's going to come back home and the final resting place is going to be in the New York area, but they're in Florida, they're going to need, unless it's cremation, they're going to need a funeral home in Florida and a funeral home in New York and there might not be a need to um, to move the pre-plan. It depends on what final disposition is uh, is planned. Thank you. So we have a couple other questions that that have come in. The question asker says, "So the account funds will be used in another state at their current fees, not locking in the price." So I think that means, let's say you pre-planned in New York and you locked in those fees, but then you died in Florida and the fees are different. How does that work? Okay, so again, that goes back to, <clears throat> excuse me, if the uh, agreement is guaranteed or non-guaranteed um, and the only way it could be guaranteed <clears throat> is if the account, <clears throat> I'm sorry, is if the account is uh, moved uh, from uh, one funeral home that is in a network to another funeral home that's in that same network. Uh, otherwise, um, it, there might be uh, a difference. Now, by the way, it's very possible that if somebody made arrangements in New York with an independent funeral home and they have a pre-planned account, that if they go to Florida and they close out the account in New York and start a new one in Florida, it's very possible that the fees in Florida are lower than those in New York. And starting all over would in fact be advantageous in some way, financially speaking. Thank you. We have uh, one more question that also came in just going back to the topic of direct cremation versus the alternative. Our participant wants to know what the difference is in terms of direct cremation versus the alternative. And the question that they should ask when they have the conversation with the funeral home. Okay, so um, I will, with your permission, defer that for the moment because that's, uh, that's gonna be covered in a couple of minutes in the context of, um, uh, of, uh, of planning. Terrific. That's okay? Thank you uh, very much. Okay, thank you. Um, so moving from the services of the funeral home to the services of a, uh, of a uh, cemetery. Um, most people know what uh, cemeteries do uh, they provide a final resting place, and there are three options. There's the traditional in-ground uh, burial called interment, although interment actually is a, a generic term for uh, all types of, uh, um, of uh, disposition, although you'll hear people use certain um, uh, terms uh, interchangeably. Uh, sometimes it's accurate, sometimes it isn't. As long as we all know what we're talking about, it really doesn't matter a whole lot. Uh, but there's in-ground in a grave, there's above ground in a mausoleum, uh, and then there is uh, cremation or cremation space. There are many, many different types of cremation spaces. There are more options for final resting place for cremated remains than uh, than uh, than the uh, than full body casket, um, and it's the fastest growing demand within the industry. Um, before I talk about direct cremation, though, some things to remember when pre-planning with a cemetery: it is essential that if you are purchasing property at a cemetery 
that you have a copy of the rules and regulations and ownership rights in that cemetery. There might be something in there that is um, a game changer or a cancellation in your, in your own mind for the planning that you want to do. In other words, you're not allowed to do X that you want to do for whatever reason. You also want to know if there are financing options available. If you're not prepared to pay in full, many cemeteries will have a payment plan. If they do, make sure, this is advice, make sure that the cemetery is the bank, as it were, that there's no third party involved. Make sure that the payment plan whether it's interest or no interest, finance charges, no finance charges, that there's no third party involved, that you are dealing directly with the cemetery and that there's no credit check or, or things like that. After all, if the arrangement is directly with the cemetery and somebody defaults, the cemetery has the best collateral that there could possibly be, which is the property itself. And cemeteries are very, very hesitant to cancel a payment plan and, uh, and bring it into default. It's just not what's in their approach. It is not the, um, uh, the wish of the cemetery to have these payment plans out there. And then it defaults, they get to pocket the money and then uh, be able to sell that same space to another person. So. You would want to find out about uh, the payment plan. You also want to have absolutely no surprises with regard to cost. And you want to make sure that all costs are disclosed, and not just the ones that are covered in the contract. There are future costs. There's the cost of the actual placement, the opening of the grave or the opening of the crypt in the mausoleum. Um, there are costs that are not necessarily from the cemetery. One might purchase a grave and the rules and regulations of the cemetery require a, a burial vault, which is something that uh, fits around the, um, uh, the casket and protects the casket and prevents to a large degree the ground from uh, settling above uh, the casket, uh, sinking as it were. Well the vault is not provided by the cemetery. That is not a cost that the cemetery can include, but doesn't matter to you if you're going to be paying $1,200 for a vault to the cemetery or the funeral home, it's the same $1,200. So you would want to know if there's anything in the rules and regulations or the particular property that you're purchasing that would incur a cost for you in the future that's not being disclosed. You also want to know if it's possible to prepay what's called service charges. Service charges are things like the grave opening and the burial itself. Many cemeteries will not allow you to prepay the service charges. Some will, some will, but I would say most will not. And that has to do with accounting issues and, um, and policy and history and things of that nature. You also might want to know if the cemetery will uh, work with insurance to cover any balance that might be on a payment plan or, um, or other kinds of costs that, uh, that uh, might be involved that were not uh, prepaid. Most cemeteries do not work with insurance. Just about every funeral home does. It's a Thank you, Robert. We have uh, an interesting question that came in. So sure. in addition to the vault, the, the concrete barrier that goes inside the grave, the question asker asked if that sort of vaulting is needed for a headstone and what uh, the cost of that would be. No, no. Uh, the, first of all, the vault is, um, there are two main types of vaults. One is concrete and the other is uh, steel or some other kind of metal. 
Um, the, uh, and it really depends on the cemetery and the kinds of things that they will, uh, they will allow. Um, the concrete vault is uh, basically, uh, looks like a big shoebox that goes into the, uh, the grave first, and then the casket is lowered into that opening, and then there's a concrete slab that fits on top of the, um, of the overall container. The steel vault looks more like um, a butter dish. There's a, uh, a tray, the casket goes on that tray, and then there's a dome that goes over the casket, and it's uh, and it locks on both ends, and that is then lowered into the grave all in one piece. As it relates to the monument, um, there is no vault for a monument. What there is is a foundation, and foundation is um, is cement, concrete. Uh, it is a, a pretty deep hole that is dug. It is the size uh, or a little larger than the base of the monument. And uh, concrete is poured into the hole. And once it sets, it's there and it will be the support for the, uh, for the monument. Um, one, one interesting thing is concrete is uh, not usually poured this time of year. Most cemeteries stop pouring concrete somewhere in late fall, early winter, and they won't start again until uh, probably April. And that has to do with temperature and snow and, um, and things of that nature. So if somebody is ordering a monument, um, that's something to keep in mind as it relates to uh, timing. That is also, by the way, one of the future costs that you would want to know from the cemetery. Um, the uh, the monument is purchased from an outside vendor. The foundation is done by the cemetery. So the cemetery can certainly tell you what the current cost is for foundation. And almost as important is that the future cost exists. When you ask questions about, okay, what didn't I ask you yet? What do you need to tell me? What should I know for the future? One of the things they should tell you is you are going to incur costs in the future for the following things. Here are the current costs so that one can plan for, uh, for that. Okay, now, direct cremation. There's a long way to get to that, I know. Uh, direct cremation is really quite simple. It is the funeral home uh, doing, again, what's called the removal of the deceased from wherever they uh, passed, bringing them to the funeral home, filling out any forms that need to be done, including uh, permits, including special forms for uh, arranging the cremation. There's more paperwork for cremation than anything else. And the reason quite simply is because it's irreversible. Once cremation is done, that's it. Whereas once a burial is done, and we have seen this many times, you can have an in-ground burial and the family some years later decides they want the person in a mausoleum because they have a family grouping someplace. So that can be changed, but once cremation is done, obviously it's done. So they do the, uh, the paperwork that's needed. They make the arrangements with the crematory. They transport the deceased to the crematory. And at that point, the funeral home is, in terms of obligations, done. And that is the extent of the service. Now, in the case of direct cremation, family is not present. It is simply the items that I mentioned. If the family wants to be involved in some way, that will more than likely add to the costs a little bit because there's the issue of supervision and, um, and the funeral home, the funeral director is obligated to stay with the deceased 
until the remains are transferred to the crematory for them to do the service they provide. So there could be additional costs involved. Sometimes people will want a uh, memorial service with a full casket before cremation is done. That then sort of cancels out the definition of direct cremation. It's no longer direct cremation. There is an additional service that is being provided. Other people, by the way, uh, and increasingly I've seen this, the direct cremation is done. The cremator remains are presented to or sent to the family. And the memorial service is done with the cremation container or urn present for the, uh, for the service rather than full casket. Again, there are no wrong answers. It's whatever fulfills the needs of the family for that famous uh, closure thing that uh, so many of us are, uh, are looking for. But that's the uh, that's direct cremation. Now, one one additional word about cremation, by the way. As I said, it's the fastest growing demand that we see in uh, in New York State. Other states are way ahead in terms of the uh, in terms of that. But we have had many people who opt for cremation, and then instead of having a final resting place, they decide to take their loved one home. That's fine. But we've also had many instances where we get a phone call in the cemetery. Somebody bought a house. They're moving in. They go to a closet to put away some stuff. And there's a little black box that has the cemetery's name on it. And that is somebody who moved out and forgot grandma or whoever. Their cremated remains are in a closet. And that's not what anybody intended uh, from the beginning. So taking the person home is okay, but at some point there's a final resting place that one should consider. Okay, now, uh, Sarah, did you have? Thank you. So we do, we do have a question that is very specific to um, burial benefits for veterans yes. in a non-national cemetery. So yes. our question asker says, can a World War II veteran who will not be buried in a military cemetery be entitled to any cemetery benefits from the veterans affairs? Okay, so this is something that a funeral director can answer more specifically, but, um, there are three pieces. One is um, there may be a benefit, a direct benefit that is available from the VA, but um, there are two areas uh, to pursue regardless of the answer to the first. One of the areas is the monument. Uh, the VA will provide uh, assistance with or a military marker for veterans who are not uh, interred in a, uh, in a veterans cemetery. Again, the, um, the funeral director uh, will know all of the specifics in that area and they will also be able to deal with the VA on behalf of the, uh, of the family. Uh, the other is the cemetery itself. Some cemeteries will offer, for lack of a better term, a discount, or put it more nicely, a consideration for uh, veterans in terms of um, uh, purchasing of, uh, of property. Uh, I can tell you that uh, when I was at Woodlawn, um, I did many, many um, veteran uh, burials of uh, people who were entitled to be buried at uh, no cost at a veteran cemetery, but family opted to have them uh, closer by, basically. That was, their, uh, that was their reason. And I'll also put into the chat for everyone, the web address to the Veterans Affairs website. They have a very specific page on burial benefits. 
Yeah. And there are lots of charts on that page and it depends when the veteran served, when they pass for you to take a look at. Also, we did a couple weeks back a program with Charlotte Trotter who works with the Westchester County um, Veterans Service Agency. And some of those specific questions were answered on that program as well as the Westchester County Veterans Service Agency who can assist um, the veteran while they're alive with looking into those sorts of benefits. So I'll put the link in the chat for everyone to look at. And Robert, we had another question come in asking, how can I make arrangements for an urn if opting for direct cremation? Okay. Um, the options you have for that are uh, every funeral home uh, can assist you in purchasing an urn. If you are uh, internet savvy and feel comfortable purchasing something online, the most convenient, the fastest, and the least costly option for an urn is, um, is online. There are several websites that will provide a large, large selection of, uh, of urns. Now, the, the only thing to keep in mind then is if you purchase the urn, um, the cremator remains have to be transferred into the urn and you may not want to do that yourself. The um, funeral home, even if you don't purchase the urn through them, they will usually do that for you. The cemetery um, that has a crematory will do the transferring for you in most cases if the remains, if the urn is being placed in the cemetery. So there are options in that regard. Some people don't mind doing it themselves. By the way, the cremation container, which is what comes from the, uh, the uh, crematory after the cremation, is usually in a very uh, heavy gauge plastic box. And inside that box is a very thick plastic bag that is sealed. And the cremator remains are in that bag. So it's not like you should have the, uh, the image of your pouring cremator remains from one place to another. Um, depending upon the opening in the urn, you could lift out that plastic bag and then just place it uh, in the urn. There are also, by the way, we get this question a lot, uh, the uh, bag is sealed and there's a, uh, a metal disc that has coding on it, which um, indicates who the, uh, who the deceased is. So uh, we get lots of questions about how do I know who I'm getting? And that's the, um, that, that's the way. Uh, so I just, um, are we still good for time, by the way? Uh, we are. We actually have a couple of very interesting questions that, oh, then, then by that, that came ahead. in. So the first is, where are we allowed to bury or scatter ashes? Okay. Um, so the answer to that question uh, is several places and more places where you're not allowed. Um, the places where you are allowed uh, and the first one I'll, I'll just throw out there with a little hesitation uh, because there are probably some nuances that, that Sarah, you might uh, want to chime in about. But uh, there are certain things one can do on their own property that they can't do in Central Park or any other public place. Um, but the two places where cremator remains can be legally scattered. There are um, locations in some cemeteries called ossuaries, which are um, underground receptacles where cremator remains are commingled with other folks, hundreds of people. And basically it's communal scattering. And then there's often an opportunity to have a, um, a memorial plaque that is on a community wall of, uh, of some type. Um, some cemeteries have that. Um, most don't, 
but some do. The other place where it's legal to scatter is at sea. But at sea um, has to be beyond, uh, I, I, sorry, I forget how many miles out, um, but there's a certain uh, number of miles off the coast that one needs to go to legally do it. Um, and there are services, by the way, that will um, do that kind of thing uh, for you. Thank you. And regarding scattering on your own property, look to your local municipality. There are local rules in Westchester County regarding the scattering of ashes and some local municipalities do require a permit for that. So always look to your uh, the town, village or city in which you live for the specific guidance on that. And then we and that's, had- That's often a, a health department kind of- it, it absolutely is, yes. Yeah, yeah. And we had another question come in also regarding ashes. And the question asker says, um, my husband and I have purchased Nietzsche's in a columbarium at our church. The mm -hmm. priest said they would permit us to have the ashes of our pets be put in the niche with us. Is there anything to address this? Uh, I'm, I'm I guess not... to be buried with your, your pet, uh, I guess assuming that your pet has been cremated. Well, yes. Uh, okay, so if the church or the cemetery uh, will permit that, then uh, you just need to decide what kind of <clears throat> what kind of uh, receptacle, whether it's a separate urn or mixed in the same urn. Um, most cemeteries will not permit um, pet remains. Uh, and um, you right. New, York, New York State um, does permit the cremated remains of a pet to be buried in a cemetery with the owner. If the pet has to be cremated with the quit pro quo. It's up to the cemetery's discretion whether or not right. to allow that. Right. So and if they allow it, the law allows it, but does not require the cemetery to do it. Correct. And Often, just as you mentioned, uh, a lot of religious organizations, if you have a longtime clergy member for your family and you have those cremated remains, will often just, uh, you know, tuck it into the casket and no one says a word before it's sealed. And um, right. that's a very right. soft and gentle way to do it and uh, doesn't go against public health regulation. Right. And also and, an, an interesting fact that I learned working with a client is that humans, so long as they are cremated, are permitted um, in New York State to be buried in a pet cemetery with their right. pet. Yep, that is that So is long correct. as both parties have been cremated and you own the plot for your pet. Now, the, one other thing, uh, I said, if, if um, uh, the cremated remains of the pet are placed in a casket, without talking to the cemetery. Just know that you're not going to be able to memorialize the pet. Uh, right. You can't, you, you, because basically that discloses what's in the casket and if the rules and regulations of the cemetery is that that's a no-no, that's, uh, that's not gonna be what you, uh, what you want. Now, even if the uh, cemetery or the church says that it's okay, you should ask the additional question of whether or not it's going to be okay to memorialize the pet. That's good advice. Okay. <clears throat> so speaking of memorials, perfect segue, that's the, the forever part. Particularly uh, today, <clears throat> just about all memorials are uh, granite in nature and granite is uh, pretty much forever. On the other hand, the memorial is often an afterthought in the process. And, um, and we back into that dis decision. We go through all the other pieces of the uh, process and then we basically find out, okay, what am I allowed to do in terms of memorial on this particular property. 
sometimes the memorial is the most important part of the uh, desires, the interests of the family. If that's the case, then they need to fold that into the decision about the particular location. And I have had many instances where uh, families um, have purchased property that is much larger than what they need for the capacity of the number of people who are going to be in that property, but they needed to do so in order to be able to accommodate the type of memorial they wanted. Now, it's true in many of these cases, in most of these cases, these were people who were notables of some type or another, and the monument, the memorial, is something that becomes, frankly, a destination for people who uh, visit cemeteries as part of, uh, of their interest in, in history. So if the memorialization part is important, uh, the only thing I would say is don't back into that decision. Don't let that decision to be, uh, to be made for you. Uh, understand what your rights are with regard to memorialization on, the, uh, on that particular uh, property. Uh, also, um, as consumers, you should know that cemeteries are not permitted to sell monuments. There's very few exceptions, but for the most part, the kind of monuments you're thinking of, whether it's upright, family monument, a, um, a slant mark or a footstone, things of that nature, cemeteries are not allowed to sell them. Funeral homes are permitted to sell them, and uh, many funeral homes do. Uh, the work that I will be doing is going to be um, separate from the operation of the funeral home, but I'm going to be housed under the same roof as a full service funeral home happens to be in, uh, in Manhattan. And, um, but so many funeral homes do uh, provide monuments, many do not. Now, again, by law, a monument has to be a written contract and it has to be separate from any other contracts, which means if you're dealing with a funeral home that does monuments, the monument contract has to be separate from the funeral home contract, and it has to have a full description of what is being purchased. There has to be, at uh, some point in the process, um, a sketch that's going to be approved by the purchaser. The specific material has to be uh, disclosed. Uh, namely granite in most uh, cases, uh, the type of granite, the origin, where it came from. There are um, a lot of discount monument dealers these days who are getting their granite from other places, mostly China. Um, the quality granite in this country comes from Vermont. There's some from Georgia, there's some from Texas, I believe, some other places, but it is out there, the quality is good, but Vermont is the granite capital uh, of the world, even though it's not the granite state, interestingly enough. Um, if one has dealt with a funeral home that does uh, provide uh, services in terms of monuments, it is often a good idea to just stick with them because they know you, you know them, presumably you trust them. If you do and feel comfortable, you can just keep going with them in the process in order to secure the uh, appropriate memorialization. So that's, um, that's basically the, 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 the monument part. Uh, any uh, questions? I, the, last, the last area I wanted to cover was communications and communications techniques. So if there are any questions at this point, I'd be happy to go over them. I think that this has been great, Robert. I think at this point, I know the communications, there was also a question about what to do with you know, pre-planning, but I think at this point, 
there's a good like kind of break point and we can cover that if it's okay with you guys in a, in a second part uh, of the webinar. That's fine with me. Yeah. Um, and Sarah, did you have anything you wanted to add? Because I just wanted to kind of like wrap it with a couple of things. No, that, that, that's terrific. We're uh, about 15 minutes over and we've had so many questions and so much interest in the topic that we would, uh, we would love to have you back for a part two uh, would, to continue talking about to. this really and important I would just, topic. I would, just, I would just insert here that the communications part is how you solve the I don't want to talk about it because the I don't want to talk about it is often the family members. And there are techniques that I can share with you that I won't say are foolproof, but they're way up there in terms of getting the job. So maybe we'll, our part two will be how to talk about it. Yes. Something to look forward to, which is, um, which is actually a good segue into what I just wanted to share, which is if you just want to, most of you should be on our uh, email list, but if you're not, um, there is a, a wonderful website where you can learn about the next webinar um, right down here, register for our, our next webinar, which is gonna be on January. Oh, it hasn't been changed yet, but it will be on January 13th. You can also, we've gotten a lot of questions about our, you know, where, is this recorded? I couldn't come this morning. I have a friend who wanted to come and our most recent webinar is here as well as um, we have all the webinars on this page. So I don't wanna take up a lot of folks time, but um, uh, there is just tremendous resources on this site. And this is where you check to see when Robert's reschedule has been done. And also Bruce, if you could just highlight our ask us button. So if a question pops yeah. up after the program, click on the Ask Us button on our website, which is seniorlawday.info on the, uh, the top right-hand corner there. Bruce, can you just drag the mouse up to that Ask Us button? Uh, sure, it's just going to, yeah, right up here. And so if you click here, uh, a, a query will pop up. You can ask us your question and we will certainly get back to you um, with the answer to your question. And uh, Robert has been kind enough to uh, answer questions even after the program. So yeah, we thank you absolutely. for for your time today, for uh, your dedication to educating the community on this very important topic, which is truly, uh, it's tough to talk about. Thank you. Great and questions, just, everybody, by the way. Uh, uh, yeah, there were great questions, great session. I just want to take another moment to thank our sponsors. Hopefully you can all see this list. Um, you know, it's been really great that we've been able to um, transition our programs to virtual during during this time. And I just wanted to, of course, thank everyone who who has attended as well as the sponsors.